Hello. Thank you for coming. It is my pleasure to welcome architect Andrew Berman to Ball State for the first architecture lecture in the College Guest Lecture Series. And thank you all for coming. Andrew is a New York City-based architect. His firm has crafted exceptional projects since their founding in 1995. These projects embody the timeless qualities of simplicity, elegance, and material expression. That was my judgment. He has been the recipient of 21 awards, including many New York AIA Design Excellence Awards, awards for preservation, the 2009 Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League of New York, and first place for the 2000 AIA New York Headquarters Competition, which gave him his gray hair. The, the firm's Sculpture Center project recently was on the cover of Architect Magazine. He became a fellow of the AIA in 2014. Andy graduated from Yale University with an undergraduate degree in architecture and a master's of architecture. He is a recipient, or at that time, he was the recipient of a traveling fellowship, I believe to Japan, uh, traveled a while, and eventually became one of a staff of three with Deborah Burke and Deborah Burke's partner and Andy. She's currently the dean of the Yale School of Architecture. So welcome, Andy, and thank you for spending the day with us. We're really appreciative. Thank, thank you. Can you hear me? Hear me okay? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for uh, lunch and the question and answer today. It was great. Um, and I also want to thank... Andy for, we talked a lot at lunch about getting jobs and internships, and Andy got me my first job, Louie, right, I forgot. And it was, a, it was an incredible experience, very, uh, very kind of unique experience, but it really keyed in with my uh, interests, and uh, Louie still calls me all the time for help. <laughs> so um, I want to show uh, a little bit about my, my context and then my practice. And so um, toward that end, I'm going to start by showing you the building from which we work, which is this old 140-year-old cast iron building. This is in downtown Manhattan, close to the financial district near the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and I show it because somehow I feel like I'm a part of it now, and it is just been incredibly informative to be somewhere for some time and be working from a place in a place. Um, we are somehow very local architects, even if we're not working locally on all of our work. Um, New York is a really interesting place to practice. It's heterogeneous, it's chaotic, it's incredibly opportunistic, and um, in that way it's also very optimistic, and that is a good tonic to uh, some of the, the difficulties of practice, I find. Um, space, light, and just space, it really, is in short supply in New York. Everything is built out. Uh, there's no vacant land. And as a result, we are always working with existing structures or against existing structures or within existing structures. And, um, and this has been very in instructive in my formation as an architect. And it's also, I think, led to a very kind of essential and parsimonious approach on my, my end, because we always have such limited resources to work with. It would be very different if we had land um, in every project, but we don't. Um, it's also taught me, I think, to, that it's incumbent upon us as architects to create the most spatial and programmatic opportunities from every opportunity, and I hope that the work bears that out. Um, working in Manhattan, one is very aware of the grid. It's everywhere at every scale, and it provides a great organizer. It gives a lot of power to the city, even if the work, the built city, is not particu particularly exceptional. The sum of it is exceptional. 
Um, and some of the very best buildings I find in New York are the fabric buildings. They're not landmarks. They're not really known by anybody or destinations. But when you see them day in and day out, and even when you have the opportunity to work with them, they become something very, very deep and something very much to aspire to. Um, and I hope that in our work we can establish the same kind of pragmatic order and opportunity that we see in cast iron buildings like this. And then, of course, behind every ordered facade is the chaos of the city. This is what you'd see behind any building. Um, chaos, fire trap, everything. And, and it, this is a, a, to me, it's a great, this kind of disparity is a great reminder of the duality of order and disorder. And very much as an architect, I feel like we're trying to rectify that at all times. We work um, on a very wide range of projects, but many are with artists. Um, artists are collaborators, they're clients, they're often users. And I've found through my education and ongoing into practice that art is very much a medium for me by which I enjoy seeing the world. It's been very much an ongoing teacher for me of how to see and how to see architecture. So in a sense, our, our represents architecture. Um, this is a photograph by Robert Rauschenberg, who lived a couple blocks from where we live. And this is very much what I see out our window in the morning still. This is a photograph of the Tr um, Trisha Brown Dance Company. I don't know if you can see that, the dancers. Where are they? They're, they're scattered around. Um, this, this is a rooftop, rooftop scene in Soho, cl again, close to where I work. And I'm working on one of the buildings right now, this building with the arched pediment. Um, but I show this because the, in, in this view, the dancers are engaging with the water towers and the industrial detritus. And then in turn, the landscape is engaging with the dancers. They're creating this feedback loop in which the landscape is being discovered, I think. And this is something that I feel, as an architect working in a place, we do. Um, we are kind of engaging in this loop of discovery. And we take our cue from what's around us. And then what's around changes in the process. Uh, this is an alphabet painting by Jasper Johns from 1962. And I show this because I just love it. Um, and this has, like all of John's work, it starts from a given. They're always givens. They're facts. They're like irrefutable facts. In this case, it's a grid and the alphabet. And then when you look closely, it's, it's all personality and gesture and particular. And I think it's a wonderful metaphor for how one can work. And again, it's something that I, I as I try to make sense of our practice, I think is expressive a bit of how we work. Uh, it's a painting by John Beach, um, another practicing New York artist. Uh, he finds things and he does things to them. Same here, just a very simple act. You find it, you do it, you obscure, you reveal. This is by Gordon Mata Clark, who cuts, or he's passed away, but he cut, he revealed, and in destroying things, he made things. Here's a photograph of something he did on a pier on the west side of Manhattan. He cut a hole in this pier. He actually cut a number of holes, conical holes, as well as rectangular. But in the process of doing something, he completely remakes architecture. Um, and I think there's something, a seed here of something that we all do or can do. Another painting, this by Susan Frecken, again, an artist from the neighborhood whose extraordinary forms um, and geometries kind of beckon and draw you in and suggest places and times. And then this is a drawing by Robert Moskowitz, who also has a studio in the neighborhood. And this is the Twin Towers. And this drawing completely captured everything I thought that was amazing about those buildings, which was the space between them the space. 
and a space around. And, and living with those two buildings and seeing what it was to walk around, move around, and always track that was just an, an amazing lesson about what architecture can be. It's not the object necessarily, but what it does to activate the place where it takes up space. So with that, I show you the first building that I worked on uh, as an independent architect uh, from 1995. And this was a photo studio that was made from a completely dilapidated brick warehouse in the meat, market, meat packing district. And I made these monumental steel and glass doors here, 12 feet tall, um, but otherwise a very anonymous project. And then inside, of, we cut in skylights and made this kind of alternate world um, it, that was completely activated by natural light. Again, very much, I think, like the seeds of a lot of what we've done subsequently. Uh, and a follow-up project to that, also for a photographer, a photo studio. This was a horse stable on the far west side. It was a derelict building, and we completely remade it in the process. And then, uh, again, introduced natural light and made a, a kind of alternate universe. And then uh, one other early project which is an addition to a old farmhouse. This is the addition. The old farmhouse was built in the 17th century, extremely old for the US. And um, this addition, I, after a lot of work, after kind of going through an enormous amount of work, I arrived at the beginning, which is a simple gabled form. And it was what had to be, as far as I could tell. And it was just a great experience to go through early on as an architect to be able to get to something that was just simple. It was incredibly liberating to be able to say, I don't have to remake the world. Um, and it's something I try to remind myself with every project. We don't have to remake it. We just have to do it very well and appropriately. This is a, another relatively early project uh, in which we built on top of an industrial building in Little Italy, Chinatown area, downtown. Um, so this is a new building on top of a six-story, 100-year-old building. And we just created a crazy landscape. We cut into the building to get the FAR to build on top. And then this is the top of the building. So just a kind of a surreal project. Again, it's very liberating to do something so unexpected in downtown Manhattan. So with that, I want to show you a couple projects quickly. This the first one is the Center for Architecture. As Andrea said in the introduction, I won this through a competition in uh, 2000, I think. So it's five years into practice, 10 years out of school, more or less, and very much feeling isolated, I'd say. Um, you know, missing the, the energy of studio, and I entered this competition, was very excited about it. Um, it's located in downtown Manhattan. The Center for Architecture had, it was a bureaucratic organization. It had an office in a top floor, upper floor of a midtown building, no public space. What they wanted to do was create a public facility. So it was a great brief, not particularly developed because they had never um, had this before, but it was a very nice idea. And they had a property, which was this um, ground floor space in a printing building, an old printing building. So all the windows are in the front, nothing in behind. And then the lower, these are the lower two floors. Um, no natural light, terrible, really kind of un unusable even for storage. So we had 15,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet of it was a relatively usable and 10,000 square feet, just not usable. And in the course of the competition, I made a series of models. This is a model here that I stitched into a photograph of the building. Here's some more models and photographs. And, um, and really, I, I started this project thinking only about potential. I didn't feel like the brief was really defined. It, or nor did it make sense even. Um, and the property was unknown. It wasn't clear what one could do or not do. It was carving into a building potentially. Um, but I wanted to make 
an entry that was suggestive of a process and of an intent, something that would be very essential and something in which the architecture could be a kind of prime agent in developing a new place where there was none. So in this section, you can see what we were given. This is the ground floor, this sidewalk and the street, and then these two lower floors are really dark, dark and unusable. And what we did was we cut the section out. We cut out slabs here, here, and here. And in so doing, we allowed the light in, and we created a three-story sectional space in which people could be 22 feet below grade down here at the lectern and see all the way out to the street and back out to the world. Um, it was, this was a hard thing to convince the board of, actually, because we were giving up valuable square footage in the process. Um, but it was what needed to happen to make value at all. Um, but I think it was, it was a great, again, a great lesson for me early on that we as architects can take relatively radical and even counterintuitive steps in order to create something of value. So here is a photograph looking in. And the center now is very much on display. You can see all three floors from the street. Here you, so you see the street on the left, sidewalk, ground floor level, mezzanine, and then this is the lecture hall down here. So the whole center becomes public. It's public by definition. They can't hide. You're always looking out when you're inside. You can, you're connected back out to the street. The space is always full with shows, but I took photographs without the shows because it's easier to see the space. And you're always looking from level to level. We went to school in a building that was all section, everything was section, and it somehow came bubbling out here, the desire to work in section. So here you are, 11 feet below grade, looking back up at the sky. And then down, all the way down in the sub-basement. And the space is, during the course of a day, this space is a gallery, it's a lecture hall, it's continuing ed, it's, it's cocktail parties. There's a ton of stuff going on here. It's, it's great. It's really great. Something else we did here was we dug two wells here. So this is a vault space. Buildings downtown have vaults under the sidewalk. And we dug two wells, each one 1,260 feet deep in order to get cold water from the earth for geothermal. So this was the first application in Manhattan for this kind of project. And the heating and cooling is done with the, by taking the cold water and running it through heat pumps. Here's the rig drilling. The worker taking a break. So it was a, this is a great event when this happened. And then this is a conference room, which I just we actually had a punch list meeting today for this room. Um, I was invited back, fortunately, to uh, update the, the center just this summer. So we just did this. The next project I want to show you is the National Opera Center, which is in Midtown. It's uh, just south of that's Madison Square Garden. That's Penn Station here. So it's in this building. And this has some real similarities to the AIA space. Um, the National Opera Center is what it sounds like. They are, are the, they are the AIA for the opera world. And they created this very large facility in New York City for all their members, which span the, the uh, globe. And opera singers and companies come here to rehearse, to try out, to audition. And um, we looked at many different properties around Manhattan for them and couldn't find the right thing anywhere. And ultimately went for something very counterintuitive, which were two floors in an, in an office building on an upper level. So it's these two floors here. Here you see the, the color coding shows you the, the brief. I'm not going to go through that. But 
here you can see what we had to do to start to get the kind of spaces we need. We had to take out slabs. Um, and fortunately, we could strike a deal with the landlord to, to allow us to do this. And we had to put in bracing, of course, within this building. This is kind of the midpoint of the building. About, I think it was about a 20-story building. And in doing, we started to create large-scale spaces that would be appropriate for our needs. So here you see the, re the uh, reception area for them. They get a lot of people coursing in um, to audition, like I said, to pr uh, produce and do everything else that an opera center would have to have people do. We cut in internal stairwells to get the people from the various levels. Created a library for the opera community. And then most importantly, we created lots of these spaces for practice and audition. This is gold in New York City. You know, people don't have a place to practice. Um, so they rent this out by the hour, or they give them away by the hour, depending on who you are. Um, and we made these little boxes within boxes so that with good acoustics. So it's a unique venue in New York City to create a public place for the music world. Um, it's very satisfying. I hear all the time of people who actually go there and work there, and then I realize that they realize I did it. I realize that they're there. It's very, it's very satisfying to see that your project is actually getting used. It's another space within it. It's a larger space. And then within, we created this audition hall, a big space, which is this. And this is, a, again, a big box within a box. Um, if you watch the New York Times music productions, they run a kind of video series. They always film it here, which is nice. So it's a little backdrop in the Times. Here's a drawing showing the, the shape and what we did. Here's the construction. So here we are on the eighth floor of a building in New York City, and you can feel the subway rumble through. When it goes through, you can hear your neighbors above and below. You can hear the, the horns and the sirens. So you know, acoustically, it's a nightmare. So what we had to do was build this box, floating floor, hung ceiling, very thick mass walls. And then within that, we built this lattice that is shaping the sound. And then we clad that with this perforated panel system. And this was all drawn. Every dot and seam was drawn, of course. And then it goes. To, it went out to a, a mill, and it was milled, and it came in as prefabricated panels. And I got a tour here, and I saw you have the equipment. You could do this here, just milling it up. Here's some details. And then the space is used. It's used for films, auditions, musical. It's a musical venue, lecture, dinners. They have their banquets here. OK, so those are two public projects. This is a private project. I'm going to show two private projects and then some more public work. This is a writing studio. And um, I should say my practice is, is about half, half public, half private. It's kind of panned out that way. And I don't have a lot of control over that. But what I do have control over is is being careful who we work with and um, increasingly trying to develop the sense of what it is that will be a good client, will be a supportive client. And, and part of our success is that we have great clients. We have found a way to get a lot of support. Um, and being an architect is very much not just finding them, but cultivating them. It's a very much a process of working together. And this was a great client. Um, an architectural historian, a writer. She bought this parcel of land and wanted to go here every day to write, every morning, really, to be precise. And we spent a lot of time on the site together, walking around and talking about what she did and what was there. And I made two drawings early on that kind of captured what I thought the project could be. This is the first. And what it shows is a portal, a threshold, that takes you somewhere else. And then once coming inside, the stair again, that just takes you away. So 
there's just this very intuitive beginning in this project of a sense of the site, where to be on the site, and then how to start to both remove oneself from the place and then re-engage with it. Here's a, a study model which shows the, the final form of the building and then shows a bit that there's a meadow and then there's a woods. And the building is at that juncture between meadow and woods. This is a, also a study model that has been collaged in a bit. But this is, again, looking at the form and trying to not just get a sense of the form, but the materiality here. So you'll see we show a lot of models because we make a lot of models. Um, that's how we work. We, of course, have computers all over, and everybody's drawing on a computer except me. But we make models because it is the prime way, I feel, that we kind of learn about the projects that we're going to ultimately build. And here's the final building. Again, the meadow in the front. It's more of a park, actually. And it's tucked into the trees in the back. The section, so you are looking at this portal door here. And then one comes up a staircase, see there, to this reading room, reading and writing room. So this, this building was made, this was a nice construction experience. It was made in a shop, these steel portal frames here. See each one there. These were made, trucked out, tilted up, bolted down. It all happened in a day. It was incredibly edifying to see your project there all of a sudden. And then uh, it was infilled here, stick built, infill. So it was a combination of shop built, and field built. We worked with a contractor who had no idea what was coming. And he was great. He just, but he had only built little cottages before. And we worked really closely together, met a lot, talked a lot. And uh, he, he, he just did a fabulous job. Here's the steel after it was erected. And here you can see what ultimately was a major part of the building, this big portal frame in the trees. Here's the entry door. Give you the idea of the scale. This is the handle here. The staircase up. So the, the experience of arriving here is very much about arriving and then leaving, and then arriving again to this little space up in the trees. And the space up in the trees, to my mind, is is satisfying because it's all lit by the sky. It's completely naturally lit. When you go in there on a gray day, you're surprised how bright the day is. And when you go in there on a sunny day, you get to watch the light track through it. And it's, it's just very nice to be in a space that's all about light. Um, and I think somehow very, very enclosed and very concentrated without being claustrophobic. There's the big, the big window at the end, and the desk. So she writes facing out. So again, like at the Opera Center, we, we drew everything, of course. That's what architects do. We drew every piece of copper. And, and this was fascinating. We actually, once we decided that copper was the material that was going to be clad for the building, um, our client bought the copper, bought big rolls, because we looked at the commodities exchange and copper prices were going up. So we just bought the copper, had it there in the garage or in the shop. Um, and then we hired a guy, again, who had no idea what was coming, but who knew how to cut and fold copper. And he made every pan and came out to the site and just locked them all together. And it really was a very, again, edifying experience that it could all come together as intended. So here you see the copper slowly aging. It turns this kind of violet 
brown color, which is, is really very beautiful. It's matte, it's reflective. It's, it's, it's like, like, like the kind of colors that come off of oil. You know, it just changes all the time. So you can see here how it can be matte, ref matte here, but, but actually just reflective enough that it dissolves into the sky here. And so this, this was, a, was a good experience. It was um, a nice opportunity to make something very sculptural, but something as strong as it is as a form, I think it's ultimately back about the site. It's a mirror to the site. It's about representing the site. This is the next project is a, a house out in Long Island. This is about another hour out, so we're three hours outside of New York City here. Um, Water Mill is in the Hamptons. It's on the southern shore of Long Island. It was all farm country until recently, just like this. And it has incredible beach. So it's everything out there is very attenuated. It's very flat, very attenuated. Um, big horizon, big sky. And, and now it's getting pretty built up. This was the site we were given. Um, a great client. I had done three lofts for this particular client, so I know her very well. And then this project is for herself, her brother, their children, and their parents. So 10, 10 people, three generations share this house. So by definition, it became a big project. Here it is, a study drawing. Here it is on the site. So the water is here. This was all wetlands that we got to plant, but it was all protected. Very circumscribed site, very hard to actually locate the building here. That was, a, that was the hard part. Um, and one of the things I just want to mention about this to think about as you look at the photos is the building is very much configured and sited to make the outdoor spaces around it, to make an entry court, to make a field, to make a dining court here outside, and to make a pool court here. The house is really about shaping the landscape. I'll go through the plans fast. Okay, so here's the entry, arrival. Um, and an initial thought was how to make something that was embracing and welcoming, but not, ex not overly exposing. And so the house, in a sense, is a lantern. It illuminates the entry and it, it suggests the occupancy, but doesn't really let you look in. And then as you arrive, you come up the steps, you can see through the entry doors out to the water. And as you pass through the house, you walk in and you get to this big room, which is running parallel to the shore. And this is where the, the 10 family members and their seemingly endless Supply of guests all get together with dining and living. There's more living space off to the left here. And then that all opens out to the pool and opens out to the yard. So you can see here, there's a lot of wood. This again was a very carefully designed and made project. I'm very fortunate to have not just the client who supported that, but um, again, very good carpenters and uh, contractors who had never done anything like this, but were totally up for the challenge and did a beautiful job. So the section, is, the section of this house is very complicated. And I have to say, I haven't found a way to photograph it to show it. Um, and I say complicated because it's, it's open. There's a lot of stitching together of spaces. And the most important thing is that the natural light from this long clerestory up here makes its way down through the house and activates the whole house. And so you're always aware of this light coming in from above. Here you are on the second floor. And you can see that there are these, there's the clerestory up here, there's a hallway behind this wood, and then there are these bridges across to the bedroom. So the natural light is coming down through here. The kitchen, very important. It's at the heart 
it's at the geographical center of the house, let's say. And it is the heart of the house. And from it, you can see out to the water. And of course, no matter how nice the weather is, there are always people here in the kitchen. A little eating kitchen. And then you can see that can, that's the eating kitchen. That connects outside to this courtyard here. So when the weather's nice, they take the meals outside. And this is a barbecue and sink prep area. So everything was designed to get people out, make beautiful within, but really connect out. So the house is this whole way of stitching back out to the landscape. And here you can see it's a stitching by views. The house frames these views out to the land. Again, the living dining room, dining table, there are these big, big bay windows that are supporting the cantilever. This cantilever runs, these timbers run from inside to outside. And outside, they create this big cantilevered overhang. So it's a big exterior room here by the porch, by the pool, I'm sorry. And then a view from the wetlands. The landscape's grown in some. It's, it's, it's more comfortable now. So you can see the ground floor is all concrete. The ground floor and the basement, there's a, there's a lower level. Um, and then the upper floors are these two, bo two linear boxes that are stacked on top of the concrete. The boxes hold the bedrooms, and the circulation is this void between the boxes. The light comes through that void. And here you can see the wood boards, the concrete, which was formed by wood boards. There's a four inch module here that runs throughout the entire house. Um, it seemed a little insane at the time, but it actually, it all worked out beautifully. I was very happy that we did this. That order is, it just kind of resonates. Here you can see that two forms coming together, these four inch boards. And you'll see, you note that the roof is planted in this project. You can see it up there. And then the, the pool at night, the whole house glows. OK. So the next few projects are all public projects. So the first ones were institutional, private. These are public. And I want to say a little bit about the public projects as a preamble. Um, Mayor Bloomberg, who had 12 years in office until recently, set up a design excellence program in New York City, which was a novel thing and ultimately an incredible opportunity for some of us architects in New York and I think for the city at large. But it was recognized that New York City, which is this giant engine of economy and spending, um, was very much in a rut of spending on poor design um, or rudderless design. And what Bloomberg uh, set up was this program by which a select group, a very small select group of architects were competed to get the eligibility to further compete to get select projects. And so we got on that list of 24 architects in New York um, and got to compete on a, a range of projects. And I did, was very fortunate to get a number of commissions through this. And I th I'd like to think um, that New York is just kind of is at the end of a golden age. And when you live in New York, you realize that 100 years ago, there was a golden age. Under Carnegie and under that, there was this whole kind of period of around the turn of the century of incredible investment into the city, infrastructure, institutions, and uh, public buildings especially, train stations, libraries, art institutions. And, and, then, and then it was a dip. And we just went through another one of these little crests, and I'm very happy that we were able to be part of it. Not in the grand way of 100 years ago, but still in a, in a meaningful way. 
So this project for the Museum of Modern Art, PS1, is one of those projects. Um, this, is, this is the site. This is in Long Island City, which is, was very much an industrial zone. This is all industrial. These are big rail yards. This is a freeway. There's an overhead train running over here. It's a crazy mashup of industrial New York. And PS1 is public school number one. It was built in 1888 as the first public school in Long Island City, which was a working class and industrial neighborhood. Um, the building was abandoned after the economy fell out and, and industry started to leave and the population dwindled. And in 1976, I think it was, um, a woman named Alana Heiss, who is a curator and kind of impresario of a big personality, took over PS1 in a kind of guerrilla act and started to show art there. And then she got traction and she got some funding and she made it legal and then she started to renovate it. And, um, and it's still going. And now it's actually part of the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA. Um, it recently joined, and they were first, they were kind of sister organizations, now they are one. Um, but it's a contemporary art museum. It's, it's a fantastic um, venue, and, I, and I'm very lucky to have been able to work here because it was a place in New York that I valued as an architect. I thought this was, this kind of was it. I love the, the atmosphere of the place. Um, never thought I would get an opportunity to work there, but through this design excellence program we, we did. Okay, this is that elevated rail nearby, just to give you a little bit of the texture. So that this is very loud here, it's very, you know, you can hear the trains roaring, there's big, big avenues, and the whole place is kind of placeless in a way. There's this giant, it's called Jackson Avenue that roars by. This was the entrance here, um, and the PS, uh, or the, the school is, is set at the back side of this block. So by the time people arrived here, they, they were lost. They didn't know where to go. They would see this big gate and they would feel deterred and then they'd start walking around the neighborhood. And so we were hired um, to try to create a place where there was no actual place. And that place had to become an entryway to the museum but the entryway is separated by a city block from the actual museum. So it's a standalone building. So here you see our site. This is the, these are the galleries here. All the rest of this are courtyards, which are programmed for art. And then these are big, this is a big boulevard here. So here was a drawing showing our entry and then this series of courtyards here, here, and here. And they lead up to these steps that take you up to the museum proper. Here's a study model showing the same. And in this model, we, we show this idea of the building as a, I guess, a lantern, if you will, something that really announces itself, holds the street, makes an entrance. It doesn't really explain itself. But one knows right away, this is an entrance. This is, you've reached your destination. These are study models um, that we made early on and then again photographed and collaged in. Um, and I have to say, I, I, I love about the models that the light we get in these models is real. It's, for all the Photoshop, the, photo, the light's not Photoshop. That's one thing I, I don't allow. And in that way, we start to get a taste of what is really coming once we build it. This shows the parts. There were all these 16-foot high concrete walls running around the property that were designed by Frederick Fisher um, in the late 70s, I think it was. And Frederick Fisher is an architect from um, Santa Monica. He worked with Frank Gehry very early on. He's a very good architect, and he did these, made these wonderful walls that I love and the neighborhood actually hates, viscerally hates. I went to a number of community board meetings here and heard people proposing that the walls be 
mo most people wanted them to just be torn down. Others wanted them to be planted on, let children paint on them, do any number of things. But nobody wanted the walls to stay. But they are, they're fabulous. And one of the things I you know, took away from these community meetings was we weren't going to make everybody very happy. But we could, I think, do something to address concerns. And I think below the, the discussed with the walls was really more a question of this feeling like a hard environment, a placeless environment. And so in this project, we tried to make a place. So here you see the walls and the doors that we added and the roof that we added. And then they come together here to make the entry kiosk. Another study in axonometric to look at the oops, sorry to look at the relationship between the ceiling and the skylights and the, the space. And then here is the build project. So you can see how the building, even on a gray day, starts to eliminate from within and create this kind of announcer of what what is back here in the way in the backdrop. So these are big, monumental glass and steel doors. It's very nice to design these with some real specificity. And on normal days, these central doors are where the, the, the attendees, to the visitors to the museum come. And then during special events, we open up these side doors to let the masses through. And they have book fairs, they have concerts barbecues, they do a lot of summer programming. You probably you might be aware of the summer architecture festival they have there. They have young architects design a, a pavilion or an event every summer. And so when they do that, it becomes a big uh, mass scene. And in this way, we can open up all the doors and the whole place kind of opens up and this becomes an open air receiver. And ultimately, this building, like so many of the others I've shown, I, I, in retrospect, I think they're really about the light, the natural light. The buildings become a way to see the light um, and enjoy the light. These, these are narrow skylights, about this wide, that span the full width. And the light comes in and attracts. This was a structurally complicated project. And this is a beam here that comes. It's a beam that folds down and then cantilevers out. Something I'll mention here and then I'll talk about later a little bit more is that in working with New York City on public projects, you have to take the low bid. The lowest contractor gets the job. Doesn't matter if he's he or she is qualified. All they have to show is that they're not wanted by the law, that they've paid their taxes, they're not part of the mafia, and strangely enough, that they haven't been doing business with Iran. But other than that, the low bidder gets the job, and that's a nightmare, right? So it's very difficult to construct a, a, a way to make highly crafted and carefully made architecture with contractors who are not necessarily in it for the craft of it. So in this way, these public, public projects are very different than the first ones I showed you. Um, but I decided early that we were not going to bend our practice or break the practice into different ways of thinking and doing. We're just going to be obstinate and hopefully very uh, crafty in how to come about building quality work. With a drawing. And then these are the big doors that open out to the courtyard and open out to the museum. And they open up, of course, and that's a, the plate. The detail showing the glass is laid on top of the steel, which is laid on top of the concrete. So there's a complete autonomy of the materials here. You can really see how they were made and how they came together. Here's a detail the glass sitting on top of the tubular steel. And then something that was very nice here was how to deal with the form holes, the concrete. And the answer was up in 
upstate New York, there was a glass factory that was making glass rods, and I could order them, and I ordered a bunch and had them cut and ground, and we you know, played with them and figured out how to get them to fit into these form holes. And they become these, oops, sorry about that, these little light plugs. And they're like, they're only one and a half inches in diameter, but they're little windows you can look through and see out. And they, they're like fiber optics as well. They pull the light through the concrete wall. And it's, it's very interesting to feel the light come through the wall. Then a view inside. And you see the sky, the light tracking during the day. And at night, to my point about the walls in the neighborhood, the lighting is a way of softening and making this look less, uh, less severe. Still severe, of course, but less. There you go. And then as part of a follow-up to this project, we renovated the galleries. So the four floors in this museum, two wings, four floors, they were heated but not air conditioned. And MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, said if you want if you want high quality art, you gotta have air conditioning, you have to have humidification. And um, this was a, a very complicated and kind of thankless job, but worth the undertaking of, of weaving all the infrastructure through um, the building. And I don't, I don't show these photos so much for the architecture, but more to make the point that I think a lot of ultimately what we do as architects is we build up relationships, clientele, and then we provide service. And so this was very much service. This huge museum needed to become part of the 21st century instead of the 19th century. And it just needed a, an awful lot of work and care to get there. And some jobs are that way. They're kind of, they end up being invisible, um, though they're still of great impact for the client or for the institution. And then, they, of course, they have great impact on as we as architects, because the learning is enormous um, to go through this kind of project. So next project is the Sculpture Center. Um, this is a museum for sculpture that is located also in Long Island City. This is PS1, and this is the Sculpture Center. And it's in a even more, what was more of a industrial zone. And this museum is for contemporary work. They don't have a collection per se. They show contemporary work. They show a lot of site-specific work. It's a really interesting place. Um, and I want to show a few slides here of process. This, the, this is from the neighborhood. Is part of this project, and well, I'm going to show you some photographs, but project, every project, I spend a lot of time going around, looking around, um, before we really develop the project to any degree, to get a feel for the neighborhood, and to see the kind of colors and patinas and materials that exist, to see the kind of beauty or ugliness that might be, and it, it, I find for myself, it's a great part of the process is to go out and photograph um, and note and just kind of create a stockpile of associations and qualities that then hopefully start to come out in the design process. So here's the museum as it was when we were hired. Is this building. The building was built in 18, no, in 1908. It was built as a trolley repair shop. So trains were brought in through this door. There used to be train tracks here. And trains would be brought inside to be repaired or rebuilt. Um, and then the site had a vacant lot next door to it here. When we started this project, which was seven years ago, everything on the street was either vacant or an automobile repair shop. Um, this building was built while we were talking about funding. Other buildings were built while we were talking about more funding. Um, working with the city, of course, is very slow. It's, you know, just to, to lock in funding and get approvals and get, get all of the kind of consensus is a very long process. Um, and so what we've seen during the course of this is this kind of mushrooming of all of these generic buildings next door and around the neighborhood. 
This is the interior before we renovated it. Um, Maya Lin did a renovation of this building about 10, 12 years ago. Did a very, very light renovation, almost invisible, but very smart. She, she kind of set the whole thing in motion in the right way. Maya Lin's the architect who designed the Vietnam Memorial. And, um, and she, she made a great start. There was no money. And it took them about 10, 12 years to get the next batch of money. This is the basement, which was inaccessible. Also the basement, inaccessible. So they, they weren't able to use this. And so this is the original building here. And this is the basement level, the original building, which was inaccessible. And we, we built here on the side lot and then subgrade down here. So a little architecture story here. We were hired to build a fire stair. The funding was for a fire stair. And I was told that the fire stair should be back there in that corner. And it didn't make sense to me what the fire It just didn't work. And if you had a fire stair, you actually needed an elevator. It had to become ADA. And then you needed a way to get in. You needed a way to get out. There was a whole complicated thing. And instead of just taking the brief and running with it, I kind of set the whole thing in, in reverse. And could do this because the executive director of the Sculpture Center, um, Mary Sarudi, is, is great. And, and the daughter of an architect and had a complete support and empathy for the process. And we started a discussion, um, much to the chagrin of the project managers, about what the Sculpture Center really could be and should be. And we were constantly hearing, well, there's only money for a fire stair. But ultimately, we, what we arrived at was they needed a lot. They needed a stair. They needed an elevator. They needed bathrooms. They needed a bookshop. They needed an entryway. They needed a reception desk. And they needed more gallery space. And with a lot of kind of patience and incremental strategizing. Together, we figured out a way to convince the city to go for it. We found the funding. We split our construction documents into two packages so that the part could go out for public funding. It was the, the kind of secret side, which could be privately funded. And it could all come together at the end. So it was a very was part of why it took seven years. But in the end, we were able to create something that was a whole unified whole that really addressed the institution's needs. So here, this is a study model, again, showing the existing building on the right and our building here on the left. That's our building. And then the doors open when they're open, when the institution is open for operations. And the space between this court 10 wall and this brick building becomes the new entryway. These are all study models. We learned this in third year, right? <laughs> MJ Long was our teacher. She had us make these big study models. And it's a habit that stuck. Here's a reception desk. We had a great intern who cut out all the books. And the trusses. We put some art in here. We looked at it at night, nighttime as well. They actually do a lot of video installations here. And here it is completed. So the old building, which I wanted very much to treat as a found object, and even though we cleaned it up enormously, wanted it to retain its kind of raw robust quality, the quality of industry, the quality of the place. And then we made ours clad in these 16-foot six, tall Corten panels. And when they went up, they were like this. And then they just have been aging, rusting out there in the weather. So as you, you walk in, we made an entry courtyard then the actual entry, and then that goes through to an exterior courtyard. So outdoor space is very precious in New York City. You know, most buildings don't have it. 
And I felt that to create even small outdoor spaces here was a great asset to the institution. So here we are. This is the seam between the new on the left and the old on the right. The steel was original, this brick wall was original, but we cut through it with this giant saw. You can see the, the new and the old. Looking from the old into the new. The new. Again, you have to see the space with the art in it. The art is usually so strong that I can't really photograph it and show it because all you see is the art. So I photographed it empty. But here you are looking past the old into the new. And part of what was so pleasing about this project was removal. We cut out the brick. We exposed the steel. And in doing so, I think we could have represented this massive anonymous structure that is a wonderful destination, even empty. Here's the bookshop. Looking to the outside, the outdoor courtyard. Another big cut here. And then the courtyard at night. And they use this for parties and dinners as well as art. And then down the basement, there are these wonderful vestiges of industry. This was all a brick and soapstone construction that was holding these massive copper electrical lines. So it was a insulator and a heat sink all at once. And part of what I wanted to accomplish here was opening up. This was cutting through the foundation wall here. So you could get enough distance to actually see the original structure and start to appreciate it. And this is one of the vaulted spaces downstairs. The doors, the new doors that we put in to replace the overhead garage doors. And these massive doors, of course, allow the art in and out. It allows trucks in and out. But it also lets the institution open up to the neighborhood for a you know, street party or for openings. And then looking from the outside in. And then at night. Interestingly, this is on a dead end. And you can only approach from this angle. So it really set us up to create some kind of signage that you could see from very far away, because you could very easily miss this little spur off this main avenue. In the evening. So to, uh, I guess, the, 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 the drawing that I showed by Bob Moskowitz with the Twin Towers, the space between, I feel like this, this kind of speaks to that sensibility of trying to create a place that negotiates between new and old and between two very different parts that have to come together and form a whole. And the last project I want to show is a public library. This is also through the New York City program of design excellence, um, as was the Sculpture Center. And this project was, uh, the client is the New York Public Library, the, the big library system that has the marble library on Fifth Avenue with the Lions. That's their headquarters, their, their main branch. And then they have, I think it's 88 satellite branches, neighborhood branches. And this is a branch in Staten Island, which is an island. It's the fifth borough. It's the alternate universe out there in New York Harbor. And this is the site. This is the harbor. This used to all be Navy land. And the Navy's left. All the breweries and the industry is left. And this is kind of a slum. Now, it's a very forgotten place. There's no, no public infrastructure. And it doesn't feel like 2015 out here. It feels very neglected. Um, this, is a, this is a park, a Victorian era park that's at the center of Stapleton, this little village. This is a typical store. This is across the street. It's constantly being re-signed and repainted. So that's, 
That's a neighbor. That's a neighbor. After renovation, that's that's still waiting for renovation. Like I said, it's really it's a really neglected neighborhood, and they had this library here built in 1906, I think it was, 1913. Um, it's a one-room library. It was built by the funds that Andrew Carnegie set up for public libraries. He gave this enormous gift of money. Um, and they built this little neoclassical library in 1913. And it served until recently. The inside was totally overstuffed. And it had this low, low lighting. It was just kind of an overburdened structure. Fortunately, it had never really been renovated, so it hadn't been ruined. It, it just was in a bad state. It just needed to be seriously cleaned out. So we were given the task of renovating the library, and then the rest of this is a lot. This was a vacant lot that we were told we could use to build the rest of the library. Um, this was a first sketch once we kind of got a sense of the program. This is the masonry building, and then this is our addition. And then that becomes the plan with our entry here on the side street, the sloping side street. This is called Canal Street. And we enter, there's reception, teen area, adult area. All of this is for the kids. And then a central core of services and a community room. Um, very interesting, the public library wants to keep all the ages apart for safety um, and security, but they also want everything open. And it was a real puzzle. How do, we, how do we create that kind of spatial definition? How do we also get people into the building? The original building had these monumental set of stairs, which were off-putting to the public and also inaccessible to handicapped people. Um, so we had to find a way in. That was part of the, the primary task. So here's an early drawing showing an idea of structure, masonry of the existing building, and then this frame building that we created. And we built this building out of glue laminated timbers. You can see the, these are the butts here. And this came about in part as a response to the low bidder conundrum problem of building these buildings. Um, I realized, I, I actually wanted to build this building out of concrete and then got into it far enough to realize that we weren't going to find anybody who could build this building out of concrete for us, uh, certainly not on budget. And so I redesigned it for timber as glue laminated because that way it had to be built in a shop. It had to be built in controlled circumstances. There were only a few shops that could do this. And for the shop, it wasn't actually that difficult. And in this way, we set up a whole system by which precision was part of the kind of DNA of the building. Here you can see the timbers being brought in and seated on the foundation plates, the footings. It's being erected. They came wrapped in paper. This is a detail showing the timbers, and then the glass. And the glass is, is fastened to a, an aluminum strip, which is then fastened to the timber. So there's a very distinct notion of materiality. And glass and wood are contrasted through this. And then here it is in the evening, the new building and the existing building. So, I want to say that, just going back to the construction of it, it really, it actually worked. Um, everything was shop built. Every connection was considered. It's a complicated geometry because the facade is sloping, the roof is sloping. And it all came together like a very nicely made puzzle. And it was, again, a great lesson in if strategizing material and fabrication with end goal, you can kind of, if you're fortunate, leap over some of the restrictions of um, bad contracts and other you know, budgetary restrictions. It also allowed the building to get 
fabricate it very quickly so we could get a roof on it and then quickly get the construction to the next level of progress. So here you see the timber. The timber becomes the architecture. The structure is the architecture. These were sized not for the loads. They actually could have been more slender, slenderer um, for the structural loads and the wind loads, but they were sized for fire. They are oversized so they can burn for a certain amount of time. And in that way, we didn't have to bring in a sprinkler system. And a sprinkler system is a very expensive, difficult to maintain, and also a liability for a library that has a lot of paper in it. So there's a kind of synergy here between structural thinking and performance and budget. And then here is the completed project just, just after they got some books on the shelves. So something to note here is that you, you have the one big roof. Everything's under the one big roof. You feel like you're always part of the same space. And then the roof is perforated by these skylights, including in the core. So there's always this natural light coming in. And just as I mentioned in the writing studio early on, I wanted this space to feel as if it was illuminated by the sky for the entire day. You felt the weather. You feel the day changing during the course of the, the movement of the sun and the movement of the clouds and the movement of the seasons. We built the furniture out of the same timbers that were used above. And the entire library is, is lined in books and CDs and videos. Um, I was thinking about the tyranny of sheetrock in this project and how so many environments you go into, are, it's all sheetrock. That's, that's kind of our default material. And here, the only sheetrock is above eight feet, where nobody can touch it. I wanted everything here to be something you could touch and would want to touch, but what you're touching are the things you came for. This is the teen area. And then this, this core here has a community room, which is open up to the top, and then it has mechanical staff lounge, bathrooms, janitor's closet. All of the all of the ductwork is all the air distribution is through here. And at night, this core is the night light for the building. The community room inside. There's a community room. It's it's got the skylights above. And then when you're inside, you can see the sloping of the street outside. So the building becomes this, you, you really, the way it's set up, it's, it, you read the section. It's a one-story building, but it still has a section. And then it's always full. For some reason, nobody ever takes their coats off. It's actually always warm. The, the heating is in the slab. We did radiant in the slab, so it's very warm. It's very comfortable. So this fellow is studying, and while we were out here photographing, he, he went around the bookcase and started to pray, like midday prayers. And at first I was like alarmed, oh my god. But uh, I thought yeah, it was very nice. He felt comfortable enough to do this. And the slab, as I mentioned, it's warm enough that you can take off your shoes and feel comfortable. And you know, in a way, it's, it's kind of edifying to see people feeling at home in, in a public place like this. The building is very, very heavily used and nicely appreciated, I think. And then this is the Carnegie here. And we just cleaned it out, really stripped it out, tried to reestablish the grandeur of the space and turned it over to the kids. And because the kids are small, the grandeur is all that, all the greater. We designed rugs here. 
I thought it would cost a fortune, but it actually was okay. We figured it out. These boards were the boards that we used to cast that concrete house. And we sandblasted the boards, and I saved a bunch of boards, and then I printed them. I, I rolled ink on them and made prints, and then we scanned those. And then those became the, the basis for this carpet. We designed the furniture here, so it was all scaled to the little kids. So when the library opened, the president of the library came out, Tony Marks, and, um, and all the congressmen and representatives, you know, all the politicos who funded it, and the neighborhood representatives. And lots of kids, lots of school kids came out, and they sat, and it was a band, and it was, you know, it was a lot of nice ceremony. And Tony Marks, the president of the library system, said, and all you kids, before you leave, you're going to get your, your very own library card. And one of the little kids raised his hand, and he said, but, but I don't have any money. I can't get a library card. And it was, it was appalling, but very touching to see that Lots of kids had no idea what this was and that they had this great asset. And uh, I say this, it's actually not, not for the architecture, because if we had built a, a monstrosity, it still would be serving the public. But this is, it's really remarkable. The public library is this incredible institution that is so aggressively going out and trying to make public space for people, whether they have the means to have their own space, whether they have Wi-Fi, whether they don't. They're just doing it indiscriminately um, based on territory, not on class or on um, means. And, and it's, it's remarkable. It's been very, very nice to be part of not just this build, but we've, we've gotten involved with several other public libraries. We just did a design study to try to address the bigger challenge of how to rope all of these disparate 88 buildings into a kind of unified and manageable whole that can be modernized as funds permit. Um, so as I said before, the, the library is a kind of luminous presence in the neighborhood, and it's, it's the only public institution anywhere around. And I'm very proud that it, it looks like it costs something. It looks like somebody took a lot of care. It really makes a statement um, it's not a storefront pretending to be a library. So um, I'm just going to wrap up now and say that a goal of each of these projects has been very much to consolidate and reveal the place and to transform, I think, the potential of what we as architects might be able to do. Um, as I mentioned, with the Sculpture Center, clients bring us briefs, they tell us what to do, and then we have to decide what to take from that and how to work with the client to really get at the heart of what is the potential and what is the need and how to create form and place that satisfies that. I feel that it's incumbent on us to make functional projects, but functional is not just that it works. Functional is that it is useful. It is people feel that it's useful. People recognize that kind of change from just a place to something that's there for them. It makes their life better. It makes their experience better. It makes their home better. It's something that I think we can do in every project, big and small. Um, and it's something that it can very much help, I think, reconnect people to what they do and the place in which they live and work. This is the building at night. It's somehow, well, if you were there, I, I hope you'd agree that it's both a strange building and it's a familiar building. It, it kind of nestles into its context. It's the right scale. It is clearly new, but it really respects the old. And I feel the strangeness is a, is a good thing. It's, it, it means that we've tried and that we have invested this huge energy and kind of concentrated thought in what we do. And 
familiar is an critical thing because it means that it can be absorbed and received and it has some credibility. And I would like to end by just saying that I feel that if we can engage in each of our projects in this kind of continuum of our neighborhoods and our places and in the history of the architecture in which we work, we have a chance of making something that can be coherent and relevant in the present and then hopefully even coherent and relevant and still functional in the future, a future that we don't even know about. And with that, I'd like to just say thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here. Questions? Somebody? Okay, there's food outside. And no one has a question. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> Billy? There's a question. Oh, yeah. Testing. Okay. With the, I guess I just have to hold it down. But, um, with this building in particular, was that front facade part of the um, plan? That you, was that part of the constraint, the original plan of the um, existing lot, or was that part of the design? Um, you mean the, the retention of the existing building? The um, no, like with the uh, facade, it's the way that it's angled. Was that part of oh, the? I see. No. No, the lot is the lot is orthogonal. Um, the angle, well, I mean, the angle in part is to create a frontage towards the public space of the park, which is located diagonally from the site. So, in in effect, this is on a side street, and if it was a, a straight facade parallel to the street, you wouldn't really see it adequately. And so the geometry is a way to start to kind of twist the building so that it ref relates to the public space, the center of the town. OK, thank you. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, my question is simple. Um, have you taught or? Do you teach or plan to ever? Um, I do not teach. I go to reviews sometimes, pretty frequently. Because there's so many schools in the city, I was curious. A lot of schools, and so mm -hmm. people ask me to come to reviews. Um, I haven't taught. I hope to teach, actually. Um, I uh, made a very self-conscious decision. I guess all decisions are self-conscious, but made a decision when I was right out of school that I wasn't going to teach then because I didn't feel like I knew what I was going to teach. And <clears throat> I recognized that some of our best teach, some of the teachers that were most important to me were practitioners. And I, I was getting them through the conversation about buildings and process. And then there were other teachers who were really smart and really articulate and sometimes even very intimidating, who were generally younger and talking a lot more than showing. And I, I wasn't of that ilk. And I couldn't imagine myself being in that position of being young and not having this kind of built up experience to try to impart over to a student. So I said, no, I'm not going to do it for a while. And then at this point, it would be nice to get out of the studio um, a little bit and uh, teach. Yeah, because I think it's a very important part of the architectural endeavor. So of course, in the office, we have a, this huge amount of teaching. Uh, some friends and I were talking the other day about the, the, the professors who have firms 
the firms have a lot more freedom. Um, thanks. In the sense that they have a supplemental income from the university they teach at, so their their office is no longer their only in their only source. So maybe they can experiment a bit more, or not everything is for income. Do you ever feel that constraint? Um, the, I mean, financial constraints are huge. They're, yeah. they're real. One has to find a way to keep the critical mass of work and people and energy going. It's it's a very difficult part of practice. Um, and you know, projects don't really show up and schedule themselves properly. They tend to stack up and you've got too much to do and then there on a Unexpected things happen, like a project goes on hold. You, you don't even lose it; it just goes on hold, and, and your your years tethered to a project. But there's no fee. There's still work. It's, it's that's a very complicated part of practice. Teaching might alleviate that, but I suspect that teaching isn't maybe enough fee to keep an office going. It might keep a principal going. Um, so it could be very helpful in that way. But I, I think, you know, for my value, for my thinking now, I think there's just a kind of richness to having a dialogue about design with people, whether it's in the studio or with students, that is part of the whole production of architecture. Thank you. Yeah, yeah um, one of the things that I really enjoyed that you said about this project that I think connected with another was you mentioned indiscriminate architecture and I think that's extremely powerful even just with this image of how it's it's just as uh, enjoyable to enter in um, if you were wheelchair bound versus just walking up the steps and I think that's um, something that's very important within architecture and then uh, another one of uh, the quotes that you mentioned was the power of uh, removal and exposure, and um, how do you how do you feel that small, uh, subtle architectural moves make or could make huge impacts on things like that, specifically towards the idea of indiscriminate architecture? Well, um, you know the. At all costs, I want to avoid the arbitrary. I, w I want our work to have a reason. It does, it's not a, the buildings aren't a built diagram of reasons, but they come together, hopefully, for some greater purpose, right? Um, and then I think there's, of course, a lot of building and architecture that veers into arbitrariness. It veers, it's maybe style driven um, or, or, or your unique experiences behind it but not kind of a bigger synthetic whole. And um, I want, like I said, I want very much that it all kind of comes together and creates a compelling whole. Now one of the great teachers for me to get to this point of being able to even be aware enough to say something like this um, or the buildings that I see around, and the buildings we work with, and the buildings in New York City, and the buildings I see when we travel all over the place. I think vernacular architecture and industrial architecture kind of shows you everything. It shows you structure, it shows you locale, it shows you use, it shows you longevity. Um, you know, it's common sense in built form, and it also is, it creates culture. And um, the kind of inherent wisdom of those types of buildings, I hope, are things that we can capture a bit in our buildings. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.